thank you ladies for being here. <laughs> you both have such a rich background. I, <laughs> I uh, am so happy to have you. I like to typically kick these things off with some rapid fire questions just to get to know both of you. So um, just whatever first comes to mind, let's go Stephanie, then Alexa. All right, favorite vacation spot? Ooh, uh, somewhere sunny, anywhere on the beach, Turks and Caicos. Ooh, that's nice. <laughs> What about you, Alexa? Uh, I'm like the exact same, anywhere on a beach. Uh, literally any beach, anywhere. Okay, perfect. Um, your female hero? My mom? My mom. Yeah, yeah, that's a pretty safe answer. Um, best way to relax? Always with a book. I love to read. Uh, exercising. Mm -hmm. Also that. <laughs> Maybe both of those on the beach, maybe. <laughs> In the sunshine, always. Um, best productivity tool or app? I am obsessed with Superhuman. Like, it has changed the way I manage email. It has changed my life. I hit inbox zero every single day. And as a founder, that is, like, very hard to do. So I got to say Superhuman for the win. Okay. I'm, like, sitting here laughing because I'm obsessed with productivity um, I'm trying to think of a new one. I mean, I literally you first of all, I'm, I'm just gonna say the internet in general is the best productivity tool. That's the truth. Like you can have the internet do everything for you. That's my headline. Okay. There you go. Um, favorite female led brand or product besides yours. <laughs> oh, <is that> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I am really into a company called Accessory Junkie, um, founded by a friend, and she curates the most incredible accessories um, from across the globe. And I feel like the idea of curation was a little bit lost in in the world recently. Like you can buy anything anywhere, but what I want to I want somebody to kind of hand pick and hand select the most mm -hmm. excellent things. Um, so big fan of Accessory Junkie. Okay. Um, I recently made just a personal investment in a company called Hill House Home. Um, which is just really, really fabulous fashion. And they just launched little girl dresses and I have two little girls and it's really, really fun. Nice. Um, okay, two more. Go to beverage. Mm. Iced tea, unsweetened with lemon. Okay. Spindrift. I'm like a walking commercial. <laughs> for I, My favorite is raspberry spindrift. Um, okay, and finally, East Coast or West Coast? Mm, I'm gonna go West Coast, even though I live on the <laughs> on the East Coast. Thanks to Alexa, my roots are definitely uh, out west. I am a New York City at heart girl. I'm all East Coast, proud New York City, Empire State of Mind. Let's do this. All right. Perfect. Well, I feel like I know both of you much better now. Um, and you two have known each other, know each other well for quite a while. Um, I'd love to hear more about that relationship and how it all started. Um, Stephanie, when did you first meet Alexa? Well, I started following Alexa early before we'd actually ever met because I was so interested in what LearnVest was doing. And at the time as a certified financial planner, let's be honest, like there a, aren't very many women in financial planning. And be not that many people that were trying to make finance interesting. And I just picked up on LearnVest and like subscribed and became obsessed, maybe secretly stalked the brand just a little bit and was a huge fangirl. And I had an opportunity to meet Alexa because I emailed feedback at learnvest.com. I was working on a tech project and I just asked like, hey, could we work on something together? And it led to us actually getting introduced, um, which led to this 10 years later. Wow. Alexa, did you hi like hire Stephanie or what was that beginning relationship for you? I actually um, won't ever forget it because we were early in the you know years of standing up Learn Bass. Um, I can't even remember what year it is, but probably it was 2010 or 2011. So it was a long time ago. Um, and somebody was like, there's this amazing person. You've got to meet her. You're going to absolutely love her. She's really passionate about what we're building. She lives in LA. And I remember thinking, we're in New York, and this was not Zoom of 2021. No. Um, and I was like, we have to hire her. And so we did. And so Steph came on as the first financial planner and and then subsequently had 
almost like nearly every role that you can have, um, uh, including overseeing all of our call center operations in Arizona, and then ultimately product and data uh, asset of the core software. Um, and there was my doppelganger. Uh, literally, she dressed up as me for Halloween once, which was hilarious. I'm not going to lie. It was so funny. And I was trying to find that photo the other day. Stuff. So um, no, but like, it just became like a sub for me on any and everything that we had to do. And uh, so have just been really fortunate uh, to get to see Steph in so many different roles. Yeah. And Stephanie, was there um, like a moment or a light bulb that went off that made you decide you wanted to start your own thing and, and run your own company? You know, it's a really good question because I think I always felt like, oh, I'm a great number two, right? Like I, I always loved being in a leadership position. I always, always worked with incredible uh, women leaders after working with Alexa. I followed another female CEO and I, I just sort of felt like, oh, I'm, I'm a number two. And as I was talking to Alexa about what had been in my head for what I wanted to solve that was unsolved from when we wrapped up LearnVest, um, it's really Alexa's inspiration that pushed me to say, I should take the leap, right? Like I, I can, I can be number one. It's a little scary, um, but I'm going to do it. And so I ultimately, I think I always saw myself as being entrepreneurial. I saw myself as a builder. I love zero to one. Like I'm the first to raise my hand for like a project that's like basically a blank piece of paper and a problem to solve. Um, I went into SoulCycle after LearnVest and Northwestern Mutual and was very early to building what is now Equinox Plus and the whole SoulCycle at home business. So I've never been afraid of being first. Um, but I think, you know, it was our friendship and longevity of, of working together that helped tip the scales from like, I have an idea that I'd love to work on. So like, I'm going to go found a company around this idea. Um, and so that's sort of the genesis of, you know, thinking on something for a really long time and then realizing your potential and yeah. taking a leap of faith. And was there collaboration between the two of you on the on the product that you were building or was the first conversation about fundraising? Always collaboration. Like there's nobody better in the world to kick an idea around with and be like, let's grab a napkin, let's grab a whiteboard. Um, we've done that a, a thousand, a million times. And so, you know, what Orem stands for today in terms of smart, real time and fully automated money movement is an extension of the vision we had it at LearnVest. It's not a consumer product but it has ties to me being a financial planner, to the work we did together, to understand how to better the American wallet. And so there really would have been no better partner. And Alexa and I spent a lot of time thinking about how to take that big concept and should it be a consumer app or would it be better as infrastructure? Um, and, and ultimately that led to the investment conversation that led to then us building it. And Alexa, you of course have been a founder yourself. Where th was there some advice that you gave Stephanie beyond the like product financial aspect, but like more personal about being a founder and things that you wish someone maybe would have told you when you got started as a founder? Yeah, it was really funny. Um, I'll never forget. So we, we literally met for breakfast at Grey Dog. Um, and it was clear to me that of all the people in my life who I thought would be like an amazing person to go take a swing and build something that Stephanie had kind of what it takes, which I think is um, a really important mix of like very passionate, committed to a big mission, a wild amount of optimism, extreme resilience, and then the ability to woo every single human that she meets. Um, and then it was a matter of, uh, again, the idea for Orum is automated money movement. Um, one of the things we talked about a lot is wallets should self-drive. Um, they really should algorithms should run your wallet. It's a big mathematical equation. And we kind of just said, let's go fix that and figure it out. Um, and so literally day one, we put money in. Um, Steph took a big jump. I took a big jump. Um, and it was just a really, really natural partnership. We've like sincerely been through hell and back before. So we're like, this is easy. Um, and then the core of Orem is solving the friction around money movement for the whole country. And if you can solve that, you literally can unlock a platform that allows for a wild amount of innovation around the American wallet. And we will not, we will get off our soapboxes because otherwise we could absolutely bore you on just how much we care about helping everyday people get better access to advice. Um, but it, I think it's been the most fun ever. I mean, people keeping like, how has like Orem accomplished so much in such a short period of time? And I'm like, Stephanie's a force of nature. Um, and we like are really comfortable 
eating problems for breakfast and just kind yeah. of that's the orientation of being a founder. And and Stephanie, were you looking for um, other investors for the seed round or what was that process like that to make the decision to raise capital? Where'd you go? What'd you do? Who helped you? All those types of things. I mean, it's just such a like interesting question because I think there's this huge disconnect between like how people end up exiting and selling their company and how they started. And nobody talks about the very beginning enough, um, especially for women who get less than 10, less than 2% of all venture capital funding. It's very challenging to break in. And so, you know, initially, uh, Alexa wrote what's called an inspiration check, right? Inspired capitals kind of precede contribution that got us to a place where we could really develop uh, our thesis on the market, our thesis on the problem we were solving, build a proof of concept, so a very light working version of the models that we now have deployed and uh, to put together the right team so that we could go raise a seed round. So the inspiration check put us in a place where we could start to make the early investment in having a framework of a product to actually go raise a seed round against. And I think through that process, you know, how we thought about when to raise money, how to raise money was really predicated on, have we talked to enough customers? Do we understand the marketplace? Do we have uh, a true proof of concept that can work in the market? Um, do we believe that there is product market fit potential? Is the problem big enough? And working through that meant not just like whiteboarding and ideating and like a room with two people, it meant getting on the phone with and asking for introductions to everyone in my network who is in FinTech, who is in banking, who's close to money movement and payments, both to get educated on the problems and the underpinnings. And importantly, to understand, would you buy a product like this? What's your willingness to pay? Would you put this on your roadmap? What problem would it be solving for you? What friction are you focused on? So that when we went to raise a seed round, it wasn't just a deck, it wasn't just an idea, it was a fully baked thesis that we knew once we had additional capital exactly how we would invest to go from step one, which is to prove out that the idea works, to step two, which is to build a working version of it and get it into market. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about and partnered with Alexa on this deeply, very sector specific investors who were going to get excited about infrastructure and payments who knew what ACH was, but of course you do some educating, but you know, generalist investors, you know, might be interested in a broader portfolio. We really looked for people that would be sector specific and stage specific so that at seed, which is the hardest make or break part in any company, we had people around the table that understood the business we were building and the phase we were in who could guide us through and have been great resources in the last 18 months to take us from that sort of seed that we planted and like green shoots of ideas to a fully fledged live product in the market. Interesting. Alexa, what, when do you know that a founder is ready to raise outside capital? Are they, there are certain milestones that you as an investor look for? It sounds like Stephanie had a bunch that she was going to hit before raising, but what about you from the investor side? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think a handful of things matter. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll speak specifically seed, Series A. Seed rounds, it's really more of a, is there a really big idea? Is there the right number for that idea? Are you then in a position where maybe you've done a lot of customer discovery and some sort of early data that this will work? And that could be some customers or that could be, you know, your first proof of concept. That's seed. Series A is really a we're turning this on. This is working. We have a long line of customers. There's early real revenue and like product market fit has been relatively figured out. So that's very much how we think about it. And obviously you get to a better series A valuation. You get more accomplished if you have the right people around the table, if you actually have done some of the other things that matter in terms of ensuring that you actually have, you know, the SWAT team that you need or the Navy SEAL sort of Olympic team that you need to go build that product. So that's how we think about it. And Inspired, one of the things that we do, and um, Stephanie knows this, um, we, first of all, um, really, really like to just help our founders. Nothing is more important than actually being able to build a business, right? And I think there's a lot of hype out there. And I think we're in a market where there's capital everywhere. And we don't really care about those things. We care about like, is the business on track? Are real things happening? Is there durable revenue? And so then also just really, we like to stress test founders before they kind of go out to fundraise in a way to say, hey, 
do we know what to do this money? Do we like, let's let not just for the sake of being able to tell people that we know, we actually need to know. Um, and I would say there's nothing lonelier than being a founder, which I definitely had many of these days and nights where you're still figuring things out and like, you're still flying the plane. Like those are the nights that are miserable because you're like, I actually don't know which direction we're supposed to go. And so one of the things we like to do is like try to help companies swing massively big and then have real plans to actually go accomplish it. Yeah. And um, I would love to hear about how you, Stephanie, practiced your pitch. Like literally, like, were you comfortable speaking in front of a room of investors prior to this? Or was there like exercises you did or how, how, how are you prepared to go do the, the literal? I'm just laughing because Steph could literally talk to investors the day she was born. Okay. So you were born to do yeah. that. Got it. Got it. So the way some people feel about public speaking is the way I feel about flying. But okay. the way that I feel about public speaking is just that it's natural. And I think actually, as Alexa said, you know, I started following the brand in 2009 and we met in 2010. I don't even think Google Hangouts was available. So when we started working together, I was in LA well before like all the technology that exists today. So I grew up on, you know, Skype, basically. I grew up as an executive in a remote setting. I ultimately relocated to New York. Um, but for a long time, I lived remotely. I worked remotely. I had a remote team. And I think that prepared me really well, I think uniquely for the fact that I was never going to meet a single investor, which I didn't know, right? I obviously knew Alexa, the inspiration check happened in 2019. And in March, when like the world starts closing down, we're just start starting our plan to be like, well, but we were going to fundraise. Like <laughs> the world just moved and, and what do we do? And so um, all the practice and prep was done just like this on Zoom, right? Um, and, and I really encourage people, despite the fact that I could get on stage in front of 10,000 people tomorrow and feel perfectly fine, not nervous, love to talk. You're trying to really deliver a very specific message, very clear, very concise message. You only have so many minutes and uh, you have them at hello or you don't. So for me, it was about refining the story. I'm a talker. I could talk all day. Did I say all the right things? Did I get the important information out? That was what I really had to practice. And I needed to practice with people who were going to give me the feedback. Like on a scale of one to 10, don't tell me it's a seven. Tell me it's a two. And then tell me what I need to do to make it better, right? I don't need to feel good. I need you to tell me what's not working. So I really encourage people um, that are getting ready to fundraise to practice a ton. Don't practice with your mom or your dad because that's a safe place. Practice with someone who gives you very hard critical feedback. Ideally, practice with an investor, even if they're not the right investor for you, if you can find someone. And practice in a way where you, you're well prepared to answer questions, but you're also comfortable saying, that's a great question. I'm going to think on that and I'll circle back because the worst thing you could do, and I'm prone to doing it, is make up an answer or flub in, in that way where you're trying to show confidence. So I will just say over and over practice. And because it's Zoom, because there's weird technicalities, because your Wi-Fi could blink, because your kids could be in the background, be prepared for the contingencies. Be ready that if you can't get on the Zoom, you know who to reach. Be prepared to have a backup plan for Wi-Fi access. So that if at the last minute something goes sideways, you're not stuck being like, I can't have the pitch. I can't have the meeting, right? And just be comfortable navigating while talking. I do it all on a single screen. I don't have dual monitors. Some people do, some don't. Just know what works for you. Practice your setup. I have a light up here. It's nothing special. It's from Target. But like, make sure your face can be seen. Why do you think I'm in the corner? So there's nothing behind me. You don't want to see yeah. the bed. You don't want to see my five-year-old's bedroom, right? You want to see me the founder. So I think- yeah small things. You should be you. You should be authentic. Um, but think through, just like you would think about your presence in person, think about your presence, your visibility, your tone, your mannerisms, um, and importantly, your follow through. Deck goes out in advance, then it goes back to top of inbox box five minutes before the meeting. As soon as you wrap the meeting, the thank yous and the follow-ups go out. Be attentive to your inbox. It's not about the one-hour pitch. It's about everything front to back that shows that you care so deeply about what you're building and you're all in on the process to, to sprint towards a fundraise, right? It's not just that one meeting as much as I think sometimes it feels like it is. That is such good advice. Alexa, do you, as the investor, like when people send the deck five minutes before and follow up with a thank you and all that, or is definitely like way above everybody else? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think, 
it, what Stephanie's saying is like these simple things really matter. And like what they do is intu intuitively, if you're an investor, you're like, wow, they're really prepared. Wow. They're really on the ball. Wow. That thank you note didn't come a week later. Like we as humans are wired to pick up on all those little things. And what you're doing is giving a really good impression. So, um, no, I mean, S Stephanie is extremely thoughtful, well-trained. And as I said, you know, she learned best, I don't know, had 35 employees ish when she joined, um, all the way through an exit and then all the way through the other side of that. So the other thing is like, we just lived through a lot. So I think, um, I always make this joke, like, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. I think sometimes people just forget that so much of being in A plus is that you have to practice. Yeah. Um, is there feedback that you, any feedback you've received while pitching that really resonated with you, Stephanie, that you've thought about a lot and has changed the way you've done it? You know, that's a really interesting question. Um, in the very beginning, um, we were fundraising in the spring of 2020, and it was so new for everybody. But one of the one of the new pieces um, that that ended up being feedback for us was about the fact that we were remote, and I was working with people I hadn't met yet, and that was like real new thinking, right? The idea that somebody might write a check to people that have never been together, have never been in a room, have never been out to dinner. And it's ultimately been one of our superpowers. Um, there are executives that I've never met that live in Seattle. There are people all over the country. There are 50 employees at Orem in 15 states. We are a remote first company. We chose to do that because COVID put us in a position where we, we realized we could maximize that opportunity. But the feedback in the beginning that we were taking a risk that was unknown to the market was not inconsequential. And there were people that could see through why they thought we were gonna succeed. But I would say there were definitely investors who questioned um, the depth of a relationship you might have. And there were things that we had to think about. How do we overcome that? Um, and, and recognizing that we weren't going to all meet and be able to spend time in an office, even if we wanted to, for the next formative six to nine months. I think in March, we didn't know that it was going to be nine months. But some people had greater intuition about that than others. And um, that was definitely one area that I think was really notably for some investors top of mind because it was so new and they themselves had never written a check to someone they'd never met, not just met, but spent extensive time with. Remember fundraising before this was dinners and trips and meals and diligence and time. We compressed it and we did it virtually. So I think we were all just living through a really new time. Now I'm a little bit scared, not that scared, but like I definitely think about What's a board meeting going to feel like if it was in person? Or what does uh, the next round of fundraising feel like when I'm getting on a plane, when I'm tired, when I'm in person and it's not the same? Um, because that's been something that we've only experienced a certain way. Um, but ultimately, I think you lean into the moment and you do exactly what you know how to do in those moments. And you listen to the feedback and ask yourself, is that feedback that changes how we're going to build the business? Is that legitimate? And, and be really honest not to be dismissive of feedback, right? Uh, because I think there's so much in what investors are willing to tell you that can can make or break whether or not your thesis is correct. Yeah, that's great. And so this whole summit is, you know, focused on leadership. So I want to take these last few minutes to kind of talk about what that means when you're at a startup or, you know, at an investment firm. Um, Alexa, I imagine you kind of mentor or help many of your portfolio founders become better leaders. Um, what are what are some of the the leadership skills that are are specific to startups? I think obviously one of them is fundraising. But are there tips and and mentorship that you give to founders about being good leaders and what that means to you? Yeah, absolutely. So a few things I'll start by saying, um, your job is the only job that I can think of that as you get better at it the learning curve gets harder and the job gets harder and it gets far more complex. So it's literally the only job that the better you are at it, the harder and worse it gets. And so two really important things come to mind. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, if you're a founder, surround yourself with um, other people who have been founders um, because uh, two things that I think really do stand out. Number one, is that I, I call it L-I-T-T-P, lean into the pain. Steph just brought this up and I think it's like a really, really important point, which is lean into feedback, lean into the things that don't work, lean into the hard stuff. 
Um, when you're a human, we are averse to pain. It's just natural, it's how we're wired. And so if you wake up, often you want to do the fun stuff, like let's better bring the company or like, let's go hang out with the employees that I absolutely love because it's going well. No, you need to go figure out the teams that are not going well, make them better, go spend the time with the problem that is making you sort of sick in your stomach. Listen to the people around you, hire people far smarter than you, and then let them give you negative feedback. Um, and I think one of the great things about Steph and I's partnership is like it's really built on a, a critical foundation of trust. Um, perfect trust where we can like, and we've had moments where it's like we pushed each other pretty hard on things. So that's the first thing is leaned into feedback. And then the second thing, which is really important, is it, you've got to ignore everything around you. Like we're in a moment where every asset price is up and to the right. We're in a moment where capital is everywhere. We're, it feels very cool to be a founder. The only time it's cool to be a founder is when it works. So don't celebrate being a founder until you've made it work. <laughs> and and I think that I, I do worry a lot about that. So it's another thing that we just, you know, um, you can ask Steph probably once a month. <laughs> I'm like, it's go time. And the great thing is I know that she knows that. So I, I would say that those are the kind of two leadership things that I, I think are really important. Um, actually, I'll give one last one. It's really hard to be a founder. You're human too. And so I think surrounding yourself with people that like some days you're going to just have a bad day. Um, and that's actually what stood out most to me about Steph, that I did have an unknown that I didn't expect. And it was so positive. Whenever she had something really, really hard, she would be like, yep, okay, next, we'll solve it tomorrow. Great. And I'd be like, oh my God, are you okay? <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> next. And I was like, holy moly, she may be like more of than I expected to pain. Um, and again, resilience is a pretty important feature, but you are allowed to be a human, but you just have to get back on the horse the next day. Okay. Keep going. Amazing. Yes. Those are good. <laughs> Stephanie, what are, what are the main differences between being a leader at a company of a, of a team and then being the leader of an entire company? What are some things that have changed for you? You know, you wouldn't, think, or maybe you would think it's different, but you know, you, I've had hundreds of people working for me before. And so, so why is this one different? This one's different because you set the culture, your voice is outsized. If I say I like, or dislike something, even if it's in passing, it's like outsized what I eat, what I drink, what I wear, people notice those things. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think probably most importantly for me, I've never had the I've had, I've had in the back of my mind, the pressure, but I now actually own the actual reality of people pay their mortgages based on the paycheck they get from Orem. People yeah. are saving for college or retirement or whatever the case may be. Like they rely on our health insurance. They rely on the longevity and runway that we're creating as a company. They're taking a risk. And when I was, you know, number two somewhere, that risk felt distanced and now it feels very personal. And every hire we make feels more personal. And I think more conviction around building a culture at the company that favors diversity, that allows us to welcome in parents. We're over 50% female, we're over 50% non-white. And I don't know actually the stat on parents, but it's wildly high for a startup. And I think that's because we've indexed on a culture that makes it okay to like have your kids in the background or whatever. So those are some things that have really like just changed me in terms of like the commitment and conviction I have to why I want to run through walls and solve hard problems and always just get up tomorrow and be like, back at it. And I think uniquely in this moment, as Alexa said, you know, if, if it's going well, it's getting harder. And that's true, right? We got bigger. We doubled in size in the last quarter. Like we feel all of that. And the leadership is to show up every day and keep believing that your vision and your mission are absolutely achievable and to empower everyone on your team to believe in that same thing, right? Not to worry about the competition, not to care about the market, to stay steadfast and focused. And I think that's the biggest leadership difference outside of the weight you carry is always helping people see the opportunity and not getting lost in what the rest of the world is saying um, and creating that inspiration, that joy, that connection with coworkers, that connection to work and mission um, that translates from like the line of code you've written or the sales deck you just made to hundreds of millions of American households having, you know, better financial well-being because of what we're doing. Um, so it's definitely different. Yeah, I, I 
can not even imagine. And you guys are both amazing to be able to run both of your brands and be just under a microscope at times. I'm sure it feels like. Um, okay, to wrap it up, I'd like you both to give us one exiting quote line, something that would be put on like a poster in someone's house that was a leader of a startup. What are you leaving them with? One piece of advice. Mm. Alexa, you first. <laughs> Uh, get up, dress up, show up. Get up early every single day. Dress up, literally dress the park, get dressed, get out of your sweats, show up with a great attitude. If you do those three things every single day and bring 120% of an attitude to work, you're going to do really successful things. Amazing. Print it. Okay, Stephanie, what about you? Oh, this one's hard. Um, <laughs> I think my best advice is to surround yourself with people that are going to work hard and who want to solve the problem that you want to solve because it's so easy to hire people that are, you know, going to say yes to your every word. And what you really want is people who are going to challenge you, challenge the status quo that have done this before, that are smarter than you, that are scary, right? You look, I look around the leadership table and I think how these people report to me, mm -hmm. um, that, that is what makes Orem possible, right? Is all of the people at the leadership level and beyond. And I think my advice is really like, shoot for the biggest talent you can possibly find in the market and be unabashed about chasing people that are going to be defining for the business that you're building. Awesome. Amen. Thank you both so yeah. much. Great advice. I loved hearing about both of your journeys and we appreciate you both spending your time with us today. All the best to both of you. Thanks for Thank having you us. so much, Grace. You're awesome. Bye.